Hi, and welcome to the Changing Perspectives podcast, the show where we discuss a variety of topics, including grief, parenting, health and wellness, and relationships. Join us and explore a number of changing perspectives. We're your hosts, Jenny and Josh Brennan. Hello, Jenny. Hi. What's going on? Nothing and everything. Nothing and everything. It's the end of a long day. You just got done teaching, and we're here in the studio recording. Because yes. we love our fans and we want to get our message out there. It's really important to us. Well, and sometimes I feel like the recording is for us. Absolutely. It's like tonight, well, this is being released on a Monday morning, but we're recording at, at night. night. And tonight's um, fourth wall breaking. Uh, tonight's content was really much needed for me because it's been. Mm, 40 has not been great to me so far. I turned 40 at the end of last <laughs> not, month. It's not even a month yet. <laughs> I'm having like health scares and health issues and doctor's appointments and cr- it's been crazy. And so I was in a funk. Yeah. I was not in a happy place. Um, but teaching always helps to sort of get me in a more positive place. So I taught a class this evening. And then our conversation that we just had with our guest was really... Um, a nice shift for me. So yeah. I'm, I'm really thankful for that shift, for that experience. And now um, I can go into, you know, the next few days in a better sort of headspace. So I'm hoping that it will be as beneficial for our listeners as Absolutely. it was for me. So as Jenny is alluding to, we have a special treat for you um, on this episode. We had our second guest ever, Changing Perspectives, uh, and we had Taylor Proctor, who is the uh, host of a podcast called Happiness Abound. She is a happiness certified happiness mentor, writer, blogger, um, again, podcast host. She's got a great Instagram, very active Instagram, Facebook, social media outlets. Again, her name is Taylor Proctor, and she was nice enough to spend a good amount of time with us talking all about happiness and self-care and positivity, positive thinking, um, lots of great topics and she talked a little bit about her dogs too so um without further ado do you have anything else to say before we play the interview no all right everybody please enjoy taylor proctor All right, Changing Perspectives fans, we have such a special treat for you. We have with us a certified happiness mentor. She's a happiness podcaster, speaker, trainer, writer. Um, She has a blog, and she can be found at happinessabound.com. It is my pleasure to introduce Taylor Proctor. Hey, Taylor. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? Fantastic, and so excited and honored and delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Oh, you're so welcome. We're very excited. I can't quite remember how I found you, but I'm very happy that I did. Um, I, You have such a wonderful <laughs> um, Instagram presence, and I am just amazed that you managed to do, put out so much content uh, with your podcast. Is it, It's daily, right, that you do a podcast? Yes, uh, every weekday. Every weekday. That's amazing. Um, and, you know, we'll definitely make sure we share all of your your pages and your information. But I feel like your podcast is very easily accessible. They're, they're relatively short sort of segments. And I learn a lot every time I watch one. It's, it's kind of a, a good way to start the day. Um, and, and so I'm really excited that you're joining us today to talk with us about happiness and about happiness mentoring, which I, I really know nothing about. And I feel a little ashamed to say that as a therapist and as a clinical social worker, but um, hopefully by the end of today, you will sort of uh, have us all feeling very enlightened and motivated about happiness and happiness mentoring. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for watching and listening to the podcast and happy to help and as always uh, the only way you can talk about happiness every day in a podcast is to love talking about happiness so I'm really excited to do one of my favorite things with you guys tonight great perfect so can can you start by sort of telling us what is a happiness expert yeah so I wouldn't necessarily call myself a happiness expert per se um but a happiness mentor, and I guess I could fall into a line of expertise, uh-huh. but a, a happiness mentor is very close to a coach, but in the sense of 
and this might be a little controversial, but I think that people need therapists and they need mentors. I agree and with you. And the two As go hand in hand. Oh, good. Yes. Because I feel like therapy is, is very important and vital to, and correct me if I'm wrong, but to uncovering why you are the way you are and working through your past traumas and understanding all of these components of your life. Mm -hmm. And a coach or a mentor can come in and be able to help you take all that information and while you're working through that, also help you to get the steps to move towards your goals and the next levels of your life. I have a number of clients who come to see me for therapy and they also have some sort of coach. Um, that is working with them. And I find that that's a really great mix. So it, it really feels sort of all encompassing. So not controversial on my end. I, I agree with you that everyone should have both a coach and a therapist. Oh, good. Well, and I think too, like, and this is where I think my little bit of controversy might come in next level is I think that there's a, a slight nuance and difference between a coach and a mentor. And that is that I found that a lot of coaches they will get you to where you need to be, but there's a lot of leaning on them. Where I was with mentors, it's a lot more of equipping. So I work very closely with my clients to make sure that they have the tools in their tool belt so that when we are completed working together, they're not alone being like, well, what next? Or, well, I went through this one thing and I had a coach, and so now I can't go through anything without a coach. It's much more, I want to make sure you're equipped with the tools, you have the, the resources available to you, you're, you're educated, you're trained on them, plus you use them in your life. And you can even go in, like, I have so many clients that will go and teach their kids these tools. So they're able to teach them to their friends and their family. They're well equipped. They're able to move forward without me after we're done working together. Oh, that's awesome. That's so exciting. So how did you get into this? Like what, yeah. what was sort of your journey to becoming a happiness mentor? Yeah. So it's a very interesting story. I actually was probably one of the angriest people I've ever met or ever had the interact, like a, a possibility to interact with. And I, I was just angry and probably the angriest person I know that's never gone to like anger management. And I, just really struggled and the thing was is that I was angry because I was scared and I would always go into fight mode I didn't want to be I didn't want to feel vulnerable I didn't want to feel weak and so I definitely didn't want to feel scared and fearful and so I would combat that by being angry and I was very unhappy very angry very much entitled and victim mentality and through a series of events and life choices, I kind of came to this conclusion that this wasn't really how I wanted my life to be and I wanted to be happy. And so I started putting in a lot of self-development and personal work to figure out what things I could do, what techniques, what exercises, what mindset shifts I needed so that I could start to be happier. And about four years, three or four years into this journey of my own personal development, I decided that I wanted to start the podcast. One, because I was very much drawn to podcasts. Two, I actually have a background and a very small blip of my life as a, in a radio career. And so it was like, yeah, I can do this. I can talk on the radio. I can edit. I could do a podcast. And then three, when I was at my worst, I would often feel like I was broken because I could see that everyone else was in my mind happy. And I wasn't, I was just angry. And anytime I would try to like pull myself out of that anger, but I wasn't researching exercises and techniques. I wasn't, wasn't really pulling myself out, but I thought I was. Mm. And every time I would do that, I would fall right back into anger and not give myself any grace and then feel like I was broken. There's something wrong with me. Everyone else is, is happy. Happiness is inherent and I'm broken. And so I started the podcast because I had discovered that I was not broken. I was not wrong. And the truth of it is, is that my happiness 
took a little bit of work. It took some work to break my current templates at the time and to change those habits, to change those mindsets. And so I started the podcast and I started it every day because I wanted to share the journey and share what it looks like every single day versus here's my story, beginning, middle, end, and here's the light of the tunnel and I'm happy now. I wanted to share it every day and share those moments where I'm like, I had a rough morning and I'm talking about the pod on the podcast about it because that's actually real life and I'm not broken. I'm not wrong. So if you're having a bad morning and you see that I'm happy all the time, like I don't want you to think you're broken or wrong because I am a human. I have emotions that are negative and I've just found the ways to work through them and I want to be able to help you work through them too. So that's kind of how things evolved and I did my podcast for about six months and then I had an opportunity to join a program that did mentoring certification and in that program it was a very intensive three months I was in a it was a large group of people broke down into smaller subgroups and so my smaller subgroup was a team of seven and we had 6 a.m phone calls every single day we had homework every single day. We had to create a program and a binder and a booklet of all these exercises and techniques that we could use to help our clients on top of the things I had already learned. And then I had to mentor 10 individuals a minimum of three times each in that period. And so it was very much hands-on, active learning, being able to help people in real time, not saying I'll wait till I'm certified to help people. And that really resonated with me because – I wasn't waiting until I had the certification to start the podcast. I just wanted to help people. And I wanted to share my happiness journey in real time so that people knew that they weren't broken, but they were capable of happiness abound in their lives. And that's kind of how things evolved and how I got here. That's amazing. What, what strikes me about your story is the authenticity behind it, that you are so willing to kind of step into who you are and say, look, this is my story. And for you to say that you were the angriest person you know, I'm, I'm really struggling to sort of even picture that, just knowing how you come across in your podcast. Like you, if I were to describe a happy person, someone who was happy, I probably would describe you and everything that you embody. So it's really inspiring to hear that you were able to kind of move yourself from being filled with so much anger to being able to find a place for such happiness in your life. And also that you recognize that it's, it's, it's not something you reach and then you're there and it's easy and it's done. It sounds like it's still something you have to kind of work at and be really mindful about. Am I correct about that? That this is sort of a a constant mm, process for you? Oh, yes, 100%. <laughs> I uh, actually, I have, I have a day job as well, and I lead three different teams. And today, even overwhelmed by a few things that happened. And I was like, okay, like, what do we do? If we identify the emotion and we allow ourselves to feel it and we don't suppress it, we express it. And then we can work through it and I can get back up right where I need to go. And I think this is part of that people believing and in, in changing the, the perspective, right? The perception yeah. of happiness. People tend to think that it's inherent. And for some people, maybe it is. But for a lot of us, it's like everyone else looks like they're happy and I'm struggling. What's wrong with me? Right? So it's like you're not broken. It's not inherent. But it does take a little bit of work and awareness and those next steps but then it also like I am a human being you're a human being we are all humans and that means we're going to have negative emotions like there's no escaping it right and that's just how it is to be a human but the difference is understanding if you have negative emotions first off you're not broken and you're not wrong second off if you have negative emotions Instead of suppressing them, which is shown in a plethora of ways, right? Over Overeating, binge watching TV, scrolling through social media for endless hours, like raising my hand right now. I've done all of those. Yep. And in fact, all at the same time for a large <laughs> amount of time. Right? And that's our way of emotional buffering. And instead of buffering and suppressing our emotions through trying to 
find other arenas to numb ourselves. Instead, express those emotions, but express them in a positive way. Mm. Don't express them in like a, a dump on somebody else, but express them in a way that is releasing them so that you can come back and swing on the other side of the pendulum back to those more positive emotions more quickly and not linger on those negative emotions feeling like you're wrong and you're broken. Do you have any sort of top, sort of the best tips or the kind of the easiest sort of takeaways for people to, um, as an example of how to express those negative feelings, those negative emotions, rather than suppressing them? What are some sort of strategies that one might use? Absolutely. What I'd like to do, if it's all right with you, is talk about uh, an awareness technique. Yes. Because I think too often, like, we feel those negative emotions, but we don't, we're not necessarily aware of them or how to change them. And then I would, yes, I want to talk about some expression, let, let go techniques. So the first one is something I call the CLEAR model, which stands for circumstance, language, emotion, action, and result. And this is a little bit of a spin off of Brooke Castillo's, she calls it the model, um, and language is something else. But essentially, it's your circumstance is neutral. And doesn't matter what's happening to you, the circumstance itself or, or around you, whatever the situation is, mm -hmm. the circumstance itself is neutral. It's the language you use in your thoughts that give it negative or positive power okay and those thoughts then then immediately jump you into the emotion correlated to those thoughts then those emotions we act on them so that's the action piece and then all of that leads to the <laughs> result that we get from that in that situation so a good example here is Let's say, so actually I was rear-ended the other day. And so hit back, back of my car I ran into. Uh -huh. And that's the kind of thing where like your first thought is like, are you kidding me? Like this person wasn't paying attention. They were on their phone. Like you're instantly kind of angry. Right. At least you are if you're me because that's my initial template. <laughs> that, that's, that was, that and is how I would react too. Yep. Okay, perfect, right? So you'd be angry. Mm -hmm. And, but the thing is, is if you kind of go back to it, the situation, the situation is neutral. Right. And your thought is this person's an idiot. Like they ran into me because they were probably texting on their phone. Like now I'm going to be late. And I'm going to have to call these people and like, oh, the insurance and everything else. And I hope the car is okay. And I'm okay. And everyone in the car is okay. Like it's just irritating and annoying. Well, all those lang all that language, all those thoughts lead to the emotion of anger. Now it's almost instantaneous, but it's not. It feels like it is, but it's a very quick reaction. And it leads to a very quick emotion. So if I got out of my car, thinking all those thoughts and being angry, what are my actions going to be based off those emotions and thoughts? My actions are going to be, you hit me. Like, what's wrong with you? We need to call the cops right now. And like, right. It would be a very different scenario that would give me a very different result. However, if you can go back to the beginning and go, this is neutral, and change your language and be like, oh, okay, I just got rear-ended. Am I okay? Yeah. I will get out. We'll check the car. hope that person's Okay. Let's see how it's going. Like, no big deal. I was on my way home, and if I'm going to be late for something, I'll just I'll have to call them and just make sure everything's okay. We'll get it figured out. That invokes an emotion of calm, an emotion of patience. So when you get out, the action you're going to take is calm and patient and caring. And then what's the result? In my case, Turned out nothing was wrong, and so the person just was like, okay, great, and I was like, great, and we parted our ways, and there was maybe a delay of two minutes, where I'm sure if I had gotten out of the car angry, <clears throat> probably would have called the police and all those other things that maybe you were supposed to do, but the cars were fine, we were fine, and would have been a huge drawn-out thing, but instead it was two minutes and done, all because the situation was the same no matter what, but I, I liken that all because... I can be aware of my emotions based on the language that I'm using in my thoughts. I really like that. And that example sort of really clearly demonstrates the, the power that your response has, right? If you had gotten, if you had stormed out of the car, 
arms flailing, kind of yelling and screaming, that would have set the other person off. It probably would have been carried through your day, through their day, and you didn't. You didn't do that. And I think it's really powerful to hear that that I've never heard that before. I never really looked at it as the situation is neutral. That makes so much sense to me. I mean, it, it just, it is what it is. It, it, whatever it is has happened. So now what? And you have a choice there. And a lot of people think you have a choice in your emotions because they're like, you know, oh, buck up. It's no big deal or whatever mm-hmm. it is. But the truth of it is, is that it's all in the language you're using. Yep. You can be you can be frustrated. Yep. And you can have that like you can be angry and upset, irritated, whatever it is, lead to that frustration, anger, that irritation. But if you can go, this is the this is not the thought that I want to have. This is not who I want to be. So, mm-hmm. like I use a, an intention statement, a declaration statement that I use in like probably five times an hour. Um, who do I want to be that reminds me to pull back to that person versus who I've been and behaving in ways that I don't want to behave in? And so to answer your full thing, like your full question, full spectrum, I think that knowing the clear model, which a lot of people don't, I, that's part of my, why I'm like, yes, I want to talk about this because it can be so transformative. Like just an understanding of that can change so much. But it's an awareness of how your emotions even come to be. Now, that said, a way to be able to express and let go of those emotions in a positive way, my because it's going to happen, right? Again, humans, it's a work mm-hmm. in progress, yep. and you're going to feel negative emotions because something sad happens. You have every right to have sad language around it and sad thoughts. So that said, a form of expression that I really love and adore is just writing things out. And I will often start my day with getting a like legal notepad and saying at the top, I, I am, or I feel, and then the first emotion that comes to my mind. So as I said that right now, because I've just come off of work and it was kind of an overwhelming day. The first one that came to my mind is I, I feel overwhelmed because So you put in the first emotion that comes to your mind. I feel blank because dot, dot, dot. And then you do like a bulleted story list of all the reasons you feel overwhelmed. And it can be a couple of single words, but ideally you want to get those stories, again, that language that you're telling yourself, out of your head, out of your body, and onto paper for several reasons. One, when stuff is in our brain and we're recycling those stories and we're trying to like remember them and work through them all in our head, things get really convoluted and they can feel really complicated, which can contribute to feeling overwhelmed and then we shut down so then we never get through it and that's when we start going to the binge watching tv and and overeating and scrolling through social media because we don't want to deal with it because we're overwhelmed so one of the best things you can do is take it out of the dare i say chaos of your brain and put it on paper and even just having it in like a bulleted list that indicates to your brain that it's organized and now it's something that we can actually handle and it's less overwhelming. So getting it out of your brain and out of your body and on paper, writing out all those stories. And then the second part of this, which is incredibly important, is to not let anyone read it. So like if you're frustrated with your spouse, I feel frustrated because and 20 of the 30 bullets points or something your spouse has done The point is to express this and get it out of you so you can come back positive and find new ways to address situations and change your language, right? So not to be like, look, this is the list of all the stuff you're doing wrong. Right. You do not (laughs) want to do that. (laughs) Right. So you write it all down. You do not let anyone see it. And then you rip it up and throw it away or you burn it. I love that. It can be such a good release of those negative emotions where you still can positively like in a very positive way express them without hurting anyone and not suppress them which hurts yourself you know i talk about that all the time with my clients and you're giving me kind of new language to use so i really appreciate that because especially when i'm working with folks around grief and loss I talk about how important it is to get those emotions out 
to not sit, to not like stuff those feelings because then they just kind of become stagnant. They don't serve any purpose. They've got to come out and they have to be released in some way. And I love what you're talking about in terms of sort of sitting down every morning, you start your day. This is a, a quick activity, but can be so, such a powerful way to start your day. I think that's a wonderful technique. So thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you for allowing me to share it. Yeah. So what kind of, are there myths out there about happiness or happiness mentoring? I mean, this is a field that I don't quite know much about, so I'm not quite sure if it's a field that has myths around it or not, but are there any? Are there things that people don't understand? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think the first one is is that for a lot of people who are starting out on a self-help and personal development journey, their thoughts are very similar to what mine were and thinking they're broken and they're not, they're, they're unfixable, unrepairable. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is, is you never need to be fixed or repaired to begin with. And I think that's a major misconception is that people feel like they're so far past broken that they can't ever feel happy. And I am of the camp. I believe that's not true. And that's why I do what I do. But that's one, that's the first thing I would say, the first myth about happiness itself. As for the profession of a happiness mentor, uh, you are spot on. Like there are a lot of life coaches. I actually don't know anyone else who defines themselves. I know a few people who decide to differentiate themselves between coaches and mentors, but coaches is a very like new, um, but fast growing industry. So there's stuff around that, but for mentors specifically, and then I don't know anyone else who's deemed a happiness mentor um, other than myself. Maybe I should do a little bit more research on that. But one of the biggest questions I get asked and the biggest misconception is that, A, the misconception being I'm happy all the time. Mm. And that that feels unattainable because it is. (laughs) And then... B, is there a lot of pressure on me by taking on the mantle of happiness mentor to be happy all the time? That's a great kind and of point And those are there. probably the two biggest myths and misconceptions. Yeah. I mean, I guess you are the only happiness mentor I know of. Um, but I didn't think about that. That uh, Does that put pressure on your shoulders to kind of feel like you have to be this perfect um, example of happiness? I, I'm guessing no, because it sounds like you're very authentic and able to say, here's where I experienced something and here's what I did and here's maybe what I wish I had done differently. There's no pressure now, but before I, before I started the podcast, actually, hmm. I, I was like, I can start the podcast. I can do this. I can do this. And I thought that it needed to be kind of what a lot of other podcasts are, right? Which I thought it needed to be an interview format. And so I interviewed a couple of people. The episodes never went live, but I interviewed a few people. And the interviews were fantastic. And I really enjoyed the process. But I found that I burnt out on the editing because I was like, I'll just do like one a month and it'll be good. And then I would do the editing and it would, I'd burn out on it. And it just wasn't sustainable for me. And it also, because I was editing for so long and so much, a lot of that was me trying to make it perfect, Mm. removing the ums and the stutters and those kind of things. And so it it burned me out. And then I was like, oh, but I really want to help people through my story as well. So maybe I'll do an an interview a month and then a solo show a month. And I did like two of those. Again, none of these published, but I was testing out the process for me and What I found on the solo shows was very similar to the interview shows, except for a little bit more pressure. And I felt like every hit had to be a home run because I was only doing one solo show a month. So it's got to be perfect. It's got to be this great outline and all those things. And this huge, like mounting pressure for perfectionism really kind of swooped in over my goal and my dream to have this podcast. And I would love to be like, yeah, it was overnight. I figured this out. No, no, no. This was like a year of stopping and starting and perfectionism kicking in and feeling like I wasn't good enough and 
would I run out of things to talk about? And nobody wants to listen to me anyways. And just all of these negative thoughts coming around. And the overarching theme was this pressure of every hit has to be a home run. And so when I finally was able to recognize that that was the core theme of the language I was using, I was able to recognize that I was a perfectionist. Like I felt like it had to be perfect because of that pressure. Like I'm talking about happiness. I better have my act together. Right. And here I am struggling to even put out a podcast. And so I struggled and I struggled and I, when I finally realized all that, I went, okay, what's the way that I can take the pressure off for every hit to be a home run? And the only way to do that is to do it every day. Mm. And that's why the show is daily. But I, I would love to be able to tell you, and I, this is a secondary thing, I would, but I would love to be able to tell you, yeah, I do it every day because that's what people need and they need that boost of positivity. Sure, but the first and foremost reason that it is every day is because that's the only way I can do it without the pressure overcoming me. Yeah, that makes sense. You sort of take the power away from the, the pressure. You know, when you have more episodes that you're putting out there, there's more room for you to say, I don't have to be perfect. Not every hit has to be a home run. Um, you're speaking baseball language, which we're just getting off baseball season with our oldest son. So it really resonates with, I think, both of us sitting here right now. Absolutely. So, Taylor, I wanted to talk to you about your podcast. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about your podcast, actually, because I was listening to episodes recently, and what really resonated with me was your, I think it's your most recent, which is using music to rapidly regain confidence. And I will tell you that I put on, I have a long commute from home, and I usually sit in traffic as well, and I was listening to your Happiness Abound songs Spotify playlist, and was loving it. So thank you for that. Oh, that makes me so happy to hear. That's awesome. I'm so glad. It's one of those playlists where I'm like, these songs are totally awesome for me. I hope other people like them. (laughs) Absolutely. And I have a special love for all kinds of different genres. I'm actually, my background is in music. And so in music theater, and I love all kinds of different genres. So it really, for me, resonated a lot. And I love a lot of the points you made in the podcast episode about how music can affect your mood. And I, listen, as a podcaster, podcast editor, podcast fan, I listen to a lot of podcasts during my commute, but I don't listen to music enough. And I think I'm going to take a lot of what you said in that episode and apply it to myself. I'm so glad to hear it. And I, I'm the same way. Like, I love podcasts. I love growing and using podcasts as intellectual self-care. But there's definitely that balance where I feel like physical and emotional self-care can come in the form of music and that kind of emotional expression. And finding that way to balance it is, is a fantastic thing to, to integrate into your routine. Even if it's just like five minutes of your commute, it can make such a difference. But... Um, that makes me so happy to hear that it resonated with you so much. Like, thank you so much for telling me and for yeah. listening to the show. That's so awesome. Oh, my my pleasure, for real. And the, the other one I wanted to shout out was, and I love uh, listening to stuff on iTunes because the episodes just keep going. And the small um, snippet, the small sort of portion of your content being like 11 minutes, 10 minutes, is it's a, the iTunes just keeps them playing. So it's really fun to listen to. And I was listening to the uh, uh, most second most recent, Tricking Your Brain into Confidence. And I wanted, you, I wanted you to talk about those concepts real quick with us. Before, you, before I let you answer, I just wanted to say I loved the Disney story. I think that's the episode your Disney story was in about going to um, hug Mickey and taking a picture. You're talking to... Very, very big Disney World fan. So that obviously resonated with me as well. So tell us a little bit more about tricking your brain into confidence. Absolutely. So that episode and yes. So really it's about we tend to not feel confident. And obviously the whole point of the episode uh, that you were discussing. 
And so how can we feel more confident and how can we trick our brain into feeling more confident? Well, a lot of that can come into play by telling yourself a story. And not just any story. So I will use the, the Disney example. However, I would have to use Disneyland because I'm in Utah. And so that's my closest Disney, <laughs> my closest Disney <laughs> callback. And I've been to Disney World once, but like from the memory of like the map of Disneyland, I can tell my story much better. But it's, it's really saying like, okay, how do I, I want to feel confident. I need to provide my brain with the details and the information that it feels like there's a gap in. So if my goal is that I want to go to Disneyland and I want to get a hug from Mickey Mouse, and your goal can be anything, right? But let's say I just tell you, like, this is, this is my goal. I want to go to Disneyland and I want to get a hug from Mickey Mouse. Well, my brain's going, okay, well, great. Like, you want to go to Disneyland you want to get a hug from Mickey Mouse? Like, that takes time and that takes money and we have to plan it and it's just not going to happen and you haven't done it yet. So there's no evidence to say that you're going to do it. So we're just going to kind of forget about it. And next time you bring it up, we're going to come up with all these thoughts being like, no, 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 like focus on other things. We probably shouldn't do that. And then you're going to feel a lack of confidence in being able to achieve that goal. Now, on the other hand, how can we trick our brain from that very automatic and very loving, but that process of trying to protect us from failure right it's trying, it's trying to keep us safe but the thing is is we want to go for our goals so it's trying to talk us out of it and we need to trick it into no we can do this and then we can feel confident to be able to do it and once we feel confident we can feel capable of doing it and once you've got those two you can get it so how do you trick your brain you need to tell a story and you need to add as much detail as possible and ideally what you want to do is tell this story and if you can record it as audio or make sure that you're saying it out loud before bed and when you first wake up so either say it out loud or play the audio and you can play it all night subliminal messaging baby of your own voice telling yourself this story so it looks like i want to go to disneyland i want to get a hug from mickey mouse or the story actually looks like, okay, so I'm going to go to Disneyland and I'm going to be waiting, like you can get into the gates and then right in the circle area uh, at the end of Bay Street, if you get there early enough, like they won't let you go to the rest of the park yet and they have a rope drop section. So I'm going to stand there with my husband and we're going to be right at the edge of the rope so I can be the first one through the castle to then go up to Toontown and meet Mickey Mouse. And so as we're standing there, like crowds starting to form behind us and people are getting excited and the guy comes out to the countdown and everyone cheers, and, Whoa! you know, and it smells great. It smells like Anaheim, California, and the Magnolias and like the uh, cafe at the end of Main Street. And just it smells amazing and everyone's cheering and happy and you can hear children laughing because it's the beginning of the day. And the guy starts doing the countdown for the rope drop. Five, four, three two, one, and the ropes drop. And it's kind of like going to the swimming pool where you're not allowed to run, but you really want to run. And so you're like really briskly walking. And I'm going to like, I have my husband with me and I'm going to kind of pulling him along because he's like, why are we running? We'll still get to go see Mickey now. And I'm like, no, no, we got to go. We're going to go see Mickey. And so we go through the castle. We run past the Peter Pan flight where people are jumping the turnstiles to be first in line. And we're running past that, and we go past the, at this point we're running because they're not yelling at us anymore, and we go past King Arthur's Carousel, and you can hear the songs playing, and we keep on going, and we go, it's a small world, and we go up into Toontown. And there's uh, the hot dog, that goofy little food stand face, and you can hear the tinkle, 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 the fountain, and I'm the first in line at Mickey's house to meet Mickey. And then he comes out. And it feels so exciting and so amazing. And he comes out, and I'm first in line, and I get to go stand with him, and he puts his arm around me, and he hugs me a little tight, and then the camera goes click, 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 and I get my picture with Mickey. Now, which one of those was more enticing and engaging to your brain? Well, the second one. Yes, I feel like I was there. It, it instantly <laughs> uplifted my mood, and also made me 
remember that they took away rope drop at Walt Disney World. And I used to love it so much. So it was so exciting to hear you talk about that. But yeah, absolutely. The second one, that's a much filler, fuller, richer, more exciting story. And when things can be full and rich and you can fill in those gaps in the details and paint the picture for your brain about what that goal mm-hmm. is going to look like, you get the evidence that can build the confidence and help you feel capable and help you achieve it. And that's how you can hack your brain into feeling more confident when it comes to getting your goals. I love it. Thank I, you. I really like that concept a lot. Um, and since I like hearing myself talk, I think I won't mind uh, recording myself <laughs> telling a fun, exciting story. Uh, Taylor, I had another question for you about self-care and happiness. So can you give us the elevator pitch type of response to someone who says, oh, I don't have time for self-care or self-care is selfish. What do you say to somebody like that? I would say I can see where you're coming from, especially on the selfish piece, because that's kind of how we've been trained. We've been trained to believe that self-care is selfish, but it's really hard to take care of other people and to love them to their fullest if you can't love yourself first. And that's a hard concept, but if you can love yourself and love who you are, love how you function in the world and really find ways to take care of yourself, then you can give so much more to everyone else that it is actually the complete opposite of selfish. And if we can look in the, there's a lot of another myth, misconception about self-care is that it's bubble baths and spa days. And the truth of it is, is that's, sure, that can be part of it, but if there's the question of, I don't have time for self-care, self-care can be as easy as five minutes a day. And there's five arenas of self-care that you can touch on, and whichever one you feel like you need that day, you can focus on, or you could focus on all three, or sorry, all five, but... It doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of time to do something physical. And now that could be taking a bath. That could be getting a massage. Or it could be jumping jacks. It could be eating an apple or something healthy that makes you feel good. Not a lot of time in eating an apple or doing a couple of crunches. But it's a way to take care of yourself very quickly physically. Then there's emotionally. And that can be something as simple as a technique we just shared and talked about where you can write out how you're feeling and then rip it up. It takes five minutes, but it's a huge asset in your emotional care toolbox. But it's not selfish. You are getting rid of those negative emotions so that you can be your best self to those that you love. So that's, there's physical, there's emotional, there's intellectual, which could be something like listening to a 10-minute or a 30-minute podcast. And whatever that time frame works for you, but you're, tr- you're intellectually stimulating your brain, and that's a form of self-care. Social self-care is the fourth one. And that can be as simple as sending a text to someone that you're like, oh, I should talk to that person. I haven't talked to them in a while. That takes two minutes. And the last one is spiritual, and that's really dependent on the individual and what their spiritual beliefs and practice- practices are. I just stay kind of high level on that. Um, so it can take, you could take three minutes and do a guided meditation and reconnect to whatever your higher power is or your higher self. And that can be a form of spiritual self care. All of those combined, picking, picking one or two or, or all of them, they can all be done in a series of 10 minutes or less. And so it's not a time thing. And they all help you become your best self by loving yourself so that you can give more to others so it's not selfish either those are great examples so josh came up with his little list of questions and i came up with mine and we didn't talk about them and i'm i'm laughing because literally 30 minutes before we got on the call i was teaching a class to master's level social work students and the way i opened the class tonight was tell me how you would rank your self-care over the past week And tell me a little bit about what you did. And it was interesting because they all kind of, not all of them, but some of them struggled with, well, 
I don't know if this counts as self-care or not. And so it's so interesting sometimes how things align to hear you talking about how self-care doesn't have to be a massage. It doesn't have to be a bubble bath. It doesn't have to be a vacation. It can be something as simple as eating an apple. It can be something as simple as sending a text. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. So I think it's funny when when things kind of line up like that. So thank you for giving us those five sort of areas of self-care and examples. I think that's a great takeaway. Um, I know in reading... You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, Am I correct that you are a dog mom? Did did it say that on your Instagram profile? Yes, I am. (laughs) I have two dogs. You have two dogs. So we we have two dogs in the studio with us right now, and our third dog is in the other room. Um, how important is being a dog mom to your happiness? And I guess I'm a little biased with this question because I can't imagine my life without dogs. They do bring me um, a lot of frustration and work, but also a tremendous amount of joy and happiness. And it's, you know, I get to see them sort of have joy over simple things. And so it's a reminder for me about in appreciating the simple things, but what's that like for you? Does that connect at all with your with your happiness and kind of with the importance you place on happiness? Well, what you said absolutely resonates with me, uh, very much in the in the same space on that. I grew I've grown up with dogs, and I've only ever had maybe a year to a year and a half of my life where there wasn't a dog in the house, and that year to a year and a half was really rough, and it was probably really rough too because it was one of my first times being out of like my parents house and kind of yeah. shifting into adulthood yeah. so it's a very hard time anyways <laughs> let alone like walking into the house and it it feels empty when there's there's not a an animal or a being there that's like so excited and happy to see you and you can be having the worst day and your dog will just love you yes. and I don't think there's anything better than that and as far as it goes to like my happiness I can't I I can't say that my happiness is brought up fully by my dogs my sure. happiness is my choice yep. but they 100% helped me in that because they are happy they don't care about my bad days they don't care if I'm in a bad mood they are still wagging their tails and actually I have one of them who's he's Australian Shepherd so in the first three days they're born they dock their tail and so he has a little bobble and he wiggles, and he has this little bobble bum, and it is the Aww. funniest and cutest <laughs> little thing, and it just makes me so happy to see him be his little bobble bum. And so it's things like that where their personality, you get to know them, and they can bring so much joy and happiness. I highly recommend a pet. <laughs> yes, for sure. But your happiness is dependent on you, but they can be a great asset and addition and relationship to help with that. Yeah, I feel like for me they're a great sort of um... – they stop a cycle for me. You know, if I'm if I'm pulling in the driveway at the end of a day and I'm just kind of, I'm not in a happy place, I step out of my car and our middle dog, I'm kind of her person. So she greets me like she jumps up in the front window and she's got her little wiggle butt and I was very happy. And instantly it's like it stops this negative chain of thoughts in my head, which I really appreciate um, and forces me to really kind of get in my head and think, okay. What person do I really want to be? Who who do I want to be right now? What do I want to do right now? What what do I want to do with sort of the thoughts I'm having? So for me, she's a great kind of tool for that. A great a great way to stop a cycle. I love that. And have you seen there's there's a quote and I think I think I've seen it on a teacher, but it says I want to be the kind of person my dog thinks I am. Yes, yes. I really, that is exactly what I think sometimes <laughs> when, I, when I step into my house and I see her looking out the window all excited. Gosh, I want to be the person that she thinks I am. She thinks I'm this great, like, joyful person that's magical. And I, I can feel that way. I can feel that way about myself, right? Why can't I? So I love that. Um, 100%. <laughs> you know, talking to you tonight has been really joyful and eye-opening, and I kind of feel like our listeners have gotten sort of like three or four episodes of your podcast into this podcast. Yes. So I'm sure knowing our listeners and knowing how interested they are in changing their perspectives and kind of leaning into something different 
I, I'm really confident that they're going to want to sort of listen to and watch your podcast. Can you tell us where they can find it? Absolutely. So it's called Happiness Abound, and that's singular, not plural, so abound. And you can find it on most major podcast listening platforms, so Spotify, Google, Apple, uh, several others. You just search Happiness Abound, and it should pull up. And then if you are more in the video space versus the audio space or you're just like, hey, yeah, I'm on Instagram, I'll check it out, I do have every episode recorded via video as well on IGTV. And you can find that by searching for happiness underscore abound. And then it's also uploaded to YouTube and Facebook. And Facebook is happiness abound blog and YouTube, very similar to the podcast platforms. If you type in happiness abound, it'll show up. Okay. Great. We will put the links to all of that in our show notes. And can we also put a link to the Spotify playlist? Oh, yes, 100%. Okay, I think that's the, great. The, I'm going to add that. that and then, perfect. perfect. And then uh, just so everyone knows, like, the title of the playlist, it's, so it's Spotify. You just type in Happiness Abound Songs, and it should come up. That's great. Did we miss anything? Is there anything else you wanted to talk about or you feel like fits in the conversation tonight? No, I'm just, I feel like I've been talking to your guys' ear off, but thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been such, such a delight, and I love being able to talk about this kind of stuff. Oh, good. Thank you so much. We're, we feel very honored that you agreed to come on and talk to our listeners. I think it's a really great fit for what folks are looking for right now. So um, thank you so much. We'd love to have you on again at some point because I know there's so much that you can talk about, so many little lessons and tools that you can kind of help our listeners put in their toolbox. Um, but thank you so much. It's been, it's been really lovely talking to you. Thank you. Taylor, we're so very lucky that you spent um, all this time with us. And again, I feel like we, our listeners got um, a lot of really great advice and they were like, had this like mini course in happiness yeah. and self-care. So I really appreciate it. Um, you can find all of Taylor's information, happinessabound.com. And Taylor, thank you so very much. Thank you. All right, everybody, that is Taylor Proctor. All right, everybody, we are back. How awesome was that, Jenny? That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, really great perspective. I hope everybody seriously really enjoyed that. I, as Jenny said at the beginning of the episode, um, she needed this. I really needed this too. It's been a tough couple of weeks for me, um, just health wise. I've been battling some sort of health we issue. Yeah. Yeah. And um, myself. And tonight I really did need a nice conversation like that. So many great techniques and tips and advice that she had to share. Um, I know that I'm a fan of her podcast and it's so easy to listen to and very digestible amounts uh, content. So I'm going to be listening to the podcast. I, as I said to Taylor, I really do enjoy that playlist. Check out that playlist on Spotify. Um, a lot of great songs really get you in a positive space. Um, and again, Listening to a podcast like Taylor's or checking out her videos on Instagram is self-care in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And self-care is not selfish. And because so many people rely on me individually, at, not only as a dad, as a coach, but as a manager at work, I have 20. So many 20. people rely on you as a dad? Are there other people out there relying <laughs> on you as a dad? So many people rely on me, period. Gotcha. New sentence. <laughs> as a dad, as a coach, um, but also as um, a manager at work. I've got 12 or 13 people that report to me. Um, and I have to, you know, be a positive um, presence um, in all of these different people's um, lives and our interactions. And so me taking care of me allows me, affords me the space to take care of them. And so I certainly appreciate all of Taylor's thoughts and concepts, and I will uh, keep listening to her podcast. Good. I think I really honestly think everyone should. I think it's a great podcast to add to your, your podcast library yeah. or to add her on Instagram or Facebook and just 
have those show up in your feed. I think Everett could benefit from Everett needs to listen to Taylor and he also <laughs> needs to trick his brain um, into confidence. I think that's what he needs as well. What, what's he happening? needs to go hug Mickey Mouse in Disneyland. Yes. Do you know what's happened here in the studio is our other dog, Norma Jean, somehow knows when we are wrapping up things. When my class is coming to an end, when the television show, we're going to have to now edit this out. No? Keep no, it. just right. keep it. When a television Whatever. show is coming to an end, she then wants to play with Everett if they're separated. So she has come to the door and she's asking Everett to play right. and Everett would like to go outside and play. Fine, so Norma Jean. He's we can happy. end this episode. He, they, they just want to go outside right. and, and have happiness abound. Yes. Nice tie-in. Do you have anything else to add? No, that was it. I hope uh, it was I hope it was good for everybody. Norma all, Jean's happy. All right, everybody. That is gonna do it for today. Thank you so very much for listening. You can learn more on this topic by checking out happinessabound.com and checking out all of Taylor Proctor's amazing um, social media outlets and websites. Please go ahead and follow us on Facebook at Changing Perspectives Podcast and on Instagram at Changing Perspectives Blog. You can check out our website by going to changingperspectivesblog.com or send us an email to changingpodcast at gmail.com. Go ahead and subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode and we will see you next time. Say bye, Jenny. Changing Perspectives podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Dizzy Bird Studios, Whitman, Massachusetts. Visit Dizzy Bird Studios on Facebook, facebook.com slash Dizzy Bird Studios.